So You Can Play That Game is proudly sponsored by NiceGameShop.com, the place to go for rare and unusual Asian games. Hi, I'm Michael. Take a seat and I'll teach you how to play Anachrony by Mind Clash Games, a sci-fi worker placement game set in the future where there's time travel, you have to use exosuits to travel around the world, and we're just trying to be the best faction come the apocalypse. Whoever ends up after the apocalypse, the most powerful, most influential faction, will end up ruling the world. The side of the board you're going to use is going to be dependent on the number of players you have. One side is for four players and the other is for two or three. And you'll find this in the top corner of the board. Also, if you're playing the solo player variant, you'll set the game up as if you're setting up for a two player. And then there are some exceptions which I'll go through at the end of the video. Then take the evacuation tile, which has flamey head on one side and normal head matching the board on the other, and you'll place this so it's complete and matches the board. You'll then want to place your research die next to the research space here, and your paradox die you'll place at the bottom of the board along with your stack of anomalies, and also you'll have seven of the super projects. So you'll shuffle these all out and then lay them out like so. You'll then lay out timeline tiles and you'll place it so it has the purpley side, not the orange side. That's used for a different module. And you have four, then the impact tile, and then three more. And you can see that the super projects line up with the timeline tiles. The rest of the unused tiles you can just put back in the box. Next, you'll want to create stacks for the various buildings and you'll shuffle each of these up for the different colours so that you have your yellow buildings in one pile, then your grey, your blue and your red. You'll then shuffle up your mine cards and put these next to the board and also your worker cards and these will go next to the board as well. Along with all this going near the board, you'll want all your tokens. So you've got your breakthrough tokens, your paradox tokens, your victory points, you've got your cores, your water, your resources, so you've got titanium, uranium, gold and neutronium, and then your workers, which are engineers, scientists, administrators and geniuses. I keep these all in a handy tray which allows me to easily set them up, store them away and move them around the table but you can put these out and store them however you wish. But you'll want to have them easily accessible to all players during the game. Then shuffle up the end game objective cards and deal out five that are going to be your objectives for that game. And again you just want to have these near the board so that players can reference them during the game. Those that are unused, you can return to the box. If you're playing the single player variant against the Chronobot, you will not use any of these endgame bonuses. Then each player will pick a path to play and take the path board. And as a group, you decide whether you're going to use the A sides or the B sides of these boards. Now, the B sides add an asymmetric nature and each one is different. Whereas the A sides, everyone ends up with the same thing. Then place your path tokens here, your time travel marker here, your morale token here, and have near the board all your warp tokens, the first player marker, and your exosuits. Place one of their path tokens under the first timeline, and this is their focus token and shows where their focus is looking at in the timeline. You then also take this small board for your path and randomly decide if you're using the A side or the B side. Either way, you'll have the same starting resources as denoted here, and you'll take these and add them to your player board. Resources and cores and water, you can just place anywhere you want. Whereas your workers, it tells you whether or not they are asleep or awake. So here we have one engineer asleep, two scientists who are awake, and two engineers who are awake. 
The other thing this card will tell you is your evacuation condition. In order to evacuate, this player, for example, needs free grey buildings. And you can find the details of all these in the rulebook. And if they successfully do an evacuation, they'll get five points. But you also get additional points when you evacuate based on the bottom criteria. The final thing to do is pick a leader for your path. You'll have two cards to choose from and you just randomly pick one or if you really want one particularly you can just select it and this will sit over where your starting resources were and gives you a special power for the game. And again you can find all the details of the special powers in the rule book. Once everyone has done this you'll then determine who was the last person to experience deja vu and they'll take their first player marker and place it on the main board. You're then ready to begin and the aim of the game is going to be to have the most points and you'll get points through loads of different things. Buildings will give you points, time travel will give you points, morale will give you points, you'll also get points for doing um, evacuation and you'll get points for various other things during the course of the game and finally at the end of the game your game points for meeting the end game conditions. Each game is made up of a series of rounds called eras and each era is represented by one of the timeline tiles so there'll be seven in a game and each era comprises of six phases. You've got your preparation, paradox, power up, warp, action rounds, and then clean up. So let's start with preparation. And the first thing you'll do in this is fill your mine. So on the right hand side here, you'll always have uranium, a gold, and then a titanium. And then the left hand side here will be based on the card. So in this case, we have two neutronium, gold and two titanium. If it was a future round we would get rid of that card and we'd play with the next card. If it's post impact it doesn't matter what the top one says, if it's post impact this top one will always be neutronium. Once you have put these out you'll then do similar for your workers that are available to recruit based on your worker card. So if this was a future round we'd discard the top card and do the next card. So we'd have two engineers and two geniuses, no scientists and no administrators. And these go on the recruitment spaces here. Next we flip over the super project for this era revealing what it is. Final step of the phase is to shift the top tile from each of the building stacks to the secondary stack. And if this was a later round there was already one there you would cover up the one that was there. So you do this for each of the different buildings. And this will of course reveal new buildings that you'll be able to build. Then the second phase is paradox. And you can skip this for your first era, but in later eras, we then look back at all the previous eras timelines to see who needs to roll for paradoxes. All you do is you look to see how many of each player's warp tokens are in each timeline. Whoever has the most in a timeline will then roll the paradox dice. And if you have a tie at this point, all tied players will roll the dice. This will come up between zero and two. For each result, the player will add a paradox token to their player board. If a player reaches three paradox tokens, then they remove all their paradox tokens and take an anomaly. When they take the anomaly, they may remove one of their previous warp tokens from the timeline. It's important to note that in a paradox phase, if a player gains an anomaly, they do not gain any more paradox during that phase. The anomalies, you'll pick one of the four rows for the different types of building, and it will go on the leftmost position. In order to get rid of this, you'll need to use action as well as losing a person and resources. Phase 3 is the power up phase and starting with your first player, each player will decide how many of their exosuits they wish to power up. Now the top three spaces are free but you can see the spaces below cost a power core to use and these costs might be different if you're using the B sides of the maps. Also after the impact happens a token will be put here so you will not get an exosuit there. Once you've chosen how many you're powering and paid the cost for any that you wish to power, 
you then gain water for any that are not powered. So in this case, you'd gain two water. Once all players have done this, you move on to phase four, the warp. And this is done simultaneously. Each player will take their warp tokens in hand and pick between zero and two that they wish to warp. And when they warp them, they'll gain the resources on them. So each player will mix them up, hold two fists out, and then simultaneously they will reveal how many tokens they have warped. Then take whatever is on the token. So in this case, it would be an extra powered up exosuit and two water. Phase five is the bulk of the gameplay and this is your actions phase. Starting with the first player, they'll choose to take an action and then each player in clockwise order will be able to take a single action. One of the actions options is of course to pass. However, this phase will end once all players have simultaneously passed. During the actions phase, you'll use your awake workers in order to perform actions. And these will go anywhere that there is the same shape space. So here in your exosuits, for example, and also down here. And at the beginning of the game, they're the only places you can place workers on your player board. You do also have an optional free action. Anywhere where you see a free action, you can do this outside of the normal action phase. So you'd be able to do a normal standard action, like send someone out in an exosuit, and also do a free action. Whenever you do a free action, you mark it with one of your path tokens. This will then be removed during cleanup, so you can do each one once in an era. And I'll explain in a moment what all these different actions do. To do any of the main board actions, a worker needs to be in an exosuit. And this is why you powered those up in the earlier phase of the game. Now, with the spaces here, any of these smaller hex spaces are designed so that they fit one exosuit. So only one player and only one worker can ever go on each of these spaces. The nomad trading and the water here are larger hexes and these are hex pools. You can put as many people in those as you wish. So the different spaces and the actions they perform, here we have gather water. Any different type of worker can go here and do remember that geniuses count as any type. So you could use a genius here as a scientist. In this case, the scientist going here gets a bonus of instead of just getting free water, you get to take four water. Then below that, we have trading with the nomads. And again, any type of worker can do this. However, if you use an administrator, they're able to do an additional trade. And the trades you can do are shown by this. So you can trade water either for a core or for two resources that are not neutronium. You can trade new two resources for neutronium or two resources for water. You can trade a neutronium for two resources or for a core, and then of course a core for a neutronium or free water. You're not able to skip steps, however, so you can't just trade free water for a neutronium. But if you were using an administrator, you could do two. So you could trade free water for two resources, which you immediately trade again for a neutronium. We're then gonna jump over the middle of the board and talk about mining. Now this is another action that any character can do. However, if the engineer does this, you can see it's got an arrow and an open eye. This means when you retrieve that worker, it will be refreshed and immediately available for use. Now you can see here there are three spaces. The spaces you go to will give you one of these resources on the right. So if you go to the top one, you get the uranium, the gold, titanium, etc. Then you also get to take any one of the resources on the left. So you'll get to take two resources, but the space you go in will dictate which of the right hand ones you get. Then in the middle of the board here, we have the most contested locations. So firstly, we have research. Now you can see that neither administrators nor engineers are able to do this action, only scientists. Also, if the top space is gone, you'll have to take the next space down. And if you go on this space, you have to discard a water in order to do the action. For this action, you take the two research dice, you pick one of the dice to set to any side that you want. So let's say I wanted a square breakthrough, 
Let's set it to a square. You then roll the other dice. And that then tells you what breakthrough tile to take. So in this case, I find the square tile with the clock symbol on. And I would take that. The next location over is the recruitment action. And this cannot be performed by scientists. And if an engineer does it, they cannot recruit a genius. However, an administrator can recruit anyone. Now, with this, you again have the space that will cost more if you go there. And you can pick any of those available, depending on what you've used, as well as getting that worker. And according to the symbol here, it shows that you get the worker refreshed and ready to use immediately. You also get a benefit based on the type. So if you take a scientist, you immediately also get two water. An engineer would get you a core. An administrator gets you a victory point. And if you take a genius, you can pick any of the other rewards to get. The final action here is build. And this can't be done by an administrator. And if you do it with an engineer, the build cost is reduced by one. And again, if you end up on the second space, it's going to cost you more water. Now, with the build action, you have two options. It will either allow you to build a building or you can build a super project. Now, building a building, you will place it on the appropriate row for that building in the leftmost space, and that will dictate the cost. For a super project, you'll pick which row you want to put it on, and it will go in the leftmost available spaces of that, and the cost is dictated by the super project. When building a building, you can choose any of the face-up tiles to build. Now, if you build one off of the main stack, that will immediately reveal a new building that another player or potentially yourself would be able to buy. If, however, you buy off the secondary stack and there's nothing below it, you do not then move a tile over. There is then less options for that building until the next preparation phase. As I said, the cost for the buildings will depend on the building you're building and the position it will be going in. So your first building will go in the first space. So in this case for this yellow, it would cost me a neutronium, two titanium and a water. Although if I used an engineer to do the build action, it would cost me one less titanium. The building would then go in that space and if I wanted to build another one, it would then cost me more because it would be one neutronium, two titanium, one gold and two water. With super projects, the victory points at the end of the game are shown in the top corner here. You then have the power here and the rule book does give you detailed descriptions of each of the powers. You then have two columns which give the cost. Now, the first cost is similar to what you would see for a building. So you're going to have resources, or in this case, four titanium, and also you'd have to discard an engineer. If we looked at another example, you can see we've got resources and a scientist. Sometimes you'll find that it's resources and water. It's very variable. However, you also have to pay the cost in the next column. Now, this can be either the precise breakthrough shown, in this case, a triangle with a microchip on, or any square breakthrough, any circle breakthrough. And that combination will be different for the different tiles. For example, this one is a triangle and a circle option. When you build a super project, you'll choose one of the four rows to place it in. Now, you can't place it where there isn't space, and you don't have to pay the costs of any spaces that you cover. However, you can't choose to place it there. It will always go on the leftmost space of the row that you choose. There are two final action spaces on the main board that I've not yet spoken about, and these are the World Council positions. Now, the one on the right here is very simple. It costs you one water, and it allows you to do any of the other actions. This is particularly useful if all the spaces for that action are already gone. Now, this other more expensive one, costing two water, is the same, except for it also allows you to put your path marker for first player on the first player spot, so you become the first player. Building buildings will give you additional actions that you're able to perform, or potentially just permanent abilities such as this one. 
the actions that you can perform, you'll notice are all following a typical pattern. So you can tell by the shape that you use a worker to do it. In this case, it needs to be a scientist. This means that you have to give away water. And this means that you can do two tri travels up to three timelines back. If you were to go here, you'd only get to time travel once back up to three timelines. So if I travel back, two spaces I can go to there and time travel has two key functions firstly if you travel back to somewhere where you have warp tokens and you can choose to travel less than your maximum then you're able to return those items if you have them such as these two water to take the warp token back when you successfully time travel and return something to the past you'll move up on this track and also having the token to use in a later era. But the other thing it does is the super project that you're able to buy and build is the one where your focus is at. So if you travel back in time, you're then able to buy the super project from the time that you've traveled back to. And you can see here that you've got actions where much like you've seen elsewhere, the person will come back refreshed. And you can see here you have a situation where if you use an administrator, they come back refreshed. But you can use anyone to do the actual action. Another thing that you can use your workers to do is close anomalies. And again, this follows the normal pattern. You've got a high resource cost. You either use a neutronium and two water, and you put the worker there. But in order to remove the anomaly, you kill the worker that you place there. But that would then save you negative points at the end of the game. The final action that you can do here is going to be important once you've done your recovering people. So obviously places like here, they come back rested. But say all your other people were here and were tired in the next era. And you need people in order to perform your actions. So you're going to have to rest and recuperate them. And that's what this bottom section here allows you to do. It allows you to move your people from re tired to rested. If you go here, the cost is equal to the number of water underneath your morale token and it will move your morale up. If you use the free action, you get all your people back and it doesn't cost you a person, but it moves your morale down. You won't, however, pay any water either. It's important to note that with this morale track, if you would ever go past the top here, you gain the number of victory points shown here. And if you would go off the bottom, you need to kill a worker. Once the actions are all done, you move on to the cleanup phase. So the first thing you'll do in this phase is retrieve your workers. And keep in mind that unless they're on a space that has this eye, that means that they come back refreshed, they're gonna be tired and you're not gonna be able to use them. Also, your exosuits will just go to the side, ready for you to power up in the next era. Next, you check if the impact occurs. So if you've just finished the fourth era, you'll then have the impact. If the impact occurs, you have a few extra steps to do. Otherwise, all you'll do is check for the game end, which will not happen until after the impact has happened anyway, because there are two ways that the game can end. Either you finish the seventh era, or all of the capital action spaces have collapsed. And I'll explain in a moment how these spaces can collapse because this happens as a result of the impact. Once this is done, you'll simply move focus onto the new era and then begin the next era. And you'll play it exactly the same as you did the previous one, except for there are a few changes for after the impact happens. So let's talk about how the game changes when the impact occurs. The first thing is you will flip the evacuation board. You now have an additional action you can perform on the main board. So it does require an exosuit. Also, you'll notice like with the water gathering and the nomads, this is a hex pool. So any number of people can go here. Also, you can use any type of worker to perform this action. And depending on the number of players, you'll need to place this minus three point marker in one of the circles. So for two players, three players, four players. What this represents is the last person to perform the evacuation will suffer those negative points.
points. It is not a requirement for a player to have performed the evacuation action, however it is a useful way to get additional points. When a player performs the evacuation, they will put one of their path tokens in the space to show that they were the first to do it, etc. You'll then take the collapsing tiles, and these are what I was speaking about a moment ago, for each of the different action types, shuffle them up and then place one on each space for each of the actions. These cover up any costs for using spaces and also give additional benefits, which you'll be able to find details for in the rule book. I won't go through all of them here. However, when in the cleanup phase you retrieve a worker off of one of these collapsed spaces, you will then flip the tile underneath that worker. This means that space is now blocked for the coming era. If all the spaces are blocked for an action, then you won't be able to perform that action unless you use the World Council up here spaces, which will always be available. If all of these are flipped at the end of an era, then it is the end of the game. Otherwise, the game ends at the end of the seventh era. Final thing that happens as a result of the impact is each player will place these blocking tokens on their exosuit spaces of their boards. So once the game has ended, either because all of the capital locations have collapsed or because you've simply reached the end of the seventh era, you'll then need to total up your scores. But before you do this, you need to untangle the continuum. If you have the resources for any of your warp tokens, you can discard those resources to remove the warp token and any that are left are going to be negative points. Also, it's worth noting that fulfilling these warp tiles in this way will not move your time travel track along. With that done, you then total up scores. At the end of the game, you'll add up the points for all the buildings that you've built, which are in the corner. You'll also add up the points for all the super projects you've built, which you can find here. You'll then minus any points for any anomalies still in your city. You'll then gain points for your time travel track, depending on how far along you've got, and also for your morale track. And it's important to note with the morale track, it is possible to have negative points. You'll also gain one point for each breakthrough you have. And if you have a set of a square, a circle, and a triangle, you get an additional two points. If you had multiple sets, you'd get multiple additional points. So here you have six breakthroughs, two sets, so 10 points. And one set on its own would be five points. Add up any of the victory point tokens that you collected during the game. And finally, you will minus two points for any of your warp tokens that are still on the timeline. The bottom section down here is then for tracking who gets the points for each of the end game bonus cards. And you can read in the rule book how each of these individually scores. Once you've gone through all of these, you've totaled up to everyone's score. Whoever has the most wins the game. And that is how you play. So before we finish this video, there's one more thing we're going to cover, and that's the changes for the solo variant, the Chronobot mode. Firstly, when setting up, you will not use end game bonuses. So just keep these in the box. Otherwise, you're set up for a normal two player game, except for your opponent's board will be the Chronobot board here. To set this up, you'll place the board out. You also place its exosuits out, and you can start off by placing all six here. After the impact, it'll only have four here each era. It will be your first player, so you can place its standee in the first player space. You'll need to have the dice nearby handy. It will have a morale token here and a time travel token here. You'll also place all of its warp tokens nearby. The final thing to do is to place these tokens labeled one to six in the corresponding spaces of the board. These are only the starting spaces. They will move around, as I'll go through in a moment. That's then all the changes for setup. In the different phases of the game, the preparation phase will play as normal. With the paradox phase, however, the chronobot always rolls last. 
Then for the power up phase, you always power six Chronobot exosuits pre-impact and four post-impact. In the warp phase, you'll resolve it in player order. So if the Chronobot's first, you'll resolve him first. The number of warp tokens he'll place out in a timeline is equal to the number of paradoxes rolled on the dice. So in this case, it'd be zero, this would be one, this would be two. The biggest change, unsurprisingly, comes to phase five, the actions phase. So when it is the Chronobot's turn, to determine what action it will do, you will roll the dice. You'll then perform the action below the number rolled. So in this case, we rolled a one. So we would perform a build energy building. And I'll go through in a moment what all these different symbols mean. In this case, you would then move the token along. So the one will always be on its own on this track up here. The five starts here, but then will join the same track that the two, three and four are on. And the six just bounces back and forth between these bottom two spaces. So there are quite a few different build spaces. When it performs a build action, you'll place its exosuit on the highest build space available. Now, if there are no building spaces available in the main board, you'll put it in the highest value world council space, thereby blocking you from being able to use it and potentially also blocking itself. And that's one important rule. If the Chronobot is ever not able to do the action that it should be doing, it will instead take a victory point and two water. So with building, it will take the highest point value building that is designated. In the case of building super project, it will take the highest value super project available and it will add it to its board. So the buildings will go here and you can see it will only have a maximum of three of each type of building. Once it has the three anymore, you would instead take a victory point on water. And the super projects, it can only have up to two. So next, let's see, we've got here time travel. So with time travel, it will simply remove a warp tile from the previous timeline space where it has the most warp tiles. And if it does so, it of course moves up on the time travel track here. The next space, if it has an anomaly here, which is where its anomalies go when it gains them, then you're able to discard either one neutronium or two of the other resources and two water to remove it. But that does require it to have it here on its player bot. And we'll say in a moment how it actually gets those. Also, it's important to note if it ever has three anomalies, it will no longer gain any anomalies or paradox. Then here we have a rest action. So if it has the available water to perform this, it will simply discard the water and move up on the morale track. If it's not able to perform this, if it doesn't have enough water, it will instead do a recruit action. And there is another space that will allow it to do a recruit action. Again, whenever it does a space for the main board, you'll take one of its exosuits and place it out on the board. So that's now two that we've used. It's important to note when you do the recruit action, it will take first a genius if it doesn't have one, then an administrator, engineer, and scientist. So if you had a genius, administrator, engineer, it would take a scientist from those available, if there was one available. If there was not a scientist available, but there was another genius, it would take the other genius. If at any point you have one of each of the different workers, it will immediately discard them and take a five victory point token. Also, when you take one of these workers, you do not gain the additional benefits, so the water or victory point, etc. We then have another build action, which we've gone through. If we then moved over here, we would do research. When the Chronobot performs research, you simply roll the shape die, and that's the only dice you care about. You then take a random breakthrough token of that shape. It will score breakthroughs the same as a normal player would at the end of the game. With the mining space, it will take resources in a similar fashion to it did the, with the recruiting. And again, it's got mining. It puts out its mining token 
blocking off a space. And the space it will go in will depend on what resources it wants. So first, if there's space it can get neutronium, it will do that, then uranium, then gold, and then titanium. And of course it will take the two resources in the same way a normal person would, and if it ever gets all four resources, one of each four, it will discard one of each four to take a five point victory token. We then have another build, this time for the grey buildings. We then got building for the white, We've got recruiting. The starting place for the number five and number six are very simple. It gains two water and this would not require it to give up an exosuit unlike the other spaces. The final one here under the six, pre-impact it will gain one victory point. Post-impact it's build a super project. If it comes to the Chronobot's turn and it has used all of its exosuits rather than take a standard turn what it will instead do is a time travel action immediately then if it comes back around to the Chronobot again it will simply pass and it will perform no further actions that era. If the player passes before the Chronobot uses up all of its exosuits then the era ends immediately Otherwise, the game plays normally, the Chronobot will never do an evacuation action and will score points in the normal fashion with its time, its morale, its victory point tokens, adding up its buildings. Everything is normal. The only difference in scoring is going to be that you won't have end game conditions. And that is how you play Anachrony by Mind Clash Games. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you have, please do give it a like, share it, subscribe to the channel, and check out the rest of the videos on the channel. And as always, thanks for watching, and bye for now.